Isaiah 22. <clears throat> We're looking at verse 23. A nail fastened in a sure place. We showed you two other words translated differently in English that are the exact same word, a nail, in verse 23. One of them was the And verse number 12 to start with, but our word is in verse 13. Now, don't ask me why this is translated this way. I'm just telling you that this is the exact same word, nail, a nail, in Isaiah 22 and verse 23. Deuteronomy 23. Hebrew word, a nail. Now, what is a paddle? It's a shovel. Again, don't ask me about how the Hebrew language works. I'm just telling you, this is the same word. Thou shalt have a paddle, a nail, a stake, a cord. Thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon. And it shall be when thou shalt ease thyself abroad, thou shalt dig therewith and shalt turn back and cover that which cometh from thee. Why? For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of the camp to deliver thee and to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shall thy camp be holy, that he see no unclean thing in thee and turn away from thee. You are to turn back and to deal with that so the Lord does not turn away from you. Now, the camp of the Lord, the people of God, the church of the living God, has been elected to holiness, Ephesians 1, 4. And the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, he himself is our nail to keep us secured in a sure and certain place that we would never fall. But he's also that paddle, that shovel, that whatever comes forth from us that would be unseemly to God, he takes care of it for us and makes sure that his Father does not have to look upon the depravity of man that is ours by birth. So the Lord Jesus was telling them in Matthew chapter 15 that it's not that which goes in a man that defileth him in his mouth, but that which cometh out, lying and all kinds of uh, extortions and so forth. He was talking, of, spiritually speaking, that it's that which comes out of us. So the Old Testament is talking about the physical, the literal, and this was, uh, as the brother said today, it was a law of sanitation. But the Bible tells us to be holy even as our Father which is in heaven is holy and that we are to provide ourselves as righteous before him. We can't do that without the Lord Jesus. So just the normal things of life that we having been born in 
the flesh born into this world would just consider to be normal everyday stuff. God, who is separate from us, higher than the heavens, he has had that fixed for you. So that the Lord Jesus Christ is your paddle, your shovel, that covers up everything that would be offensive to God and buries it back into the earth. That's all I got. But that is the word nail there in that verse, the word paddle. Isaiah 22. The book of Isaiah chapter 22. The one thing that we realize in verses 20 and 21 is that this man, Eliakim, is the replacement of Shebna. Now, Shebna, we found in verse 25, was also called a nail that is fastened in a sure place, but he is removable. We went over to Romans chapter 9 and read you about Pharaoh. Don't miss this point. Pharaoh was a man that God raised up. That's what Eliakim means. It was Pharaoh's responsibility, first of all, for him to know God, and second of all, for him to legislate according to the holiness and the glory of God. It just as much as it was Shebna's responsibility to be a true and a holy man of God and not have the need for carrying out the office that God gave them and they will have to answer for that. He says of Cyrus that he's my friend, he's my shepherd, he's mine anointed. And then right on down there a few more verses it said, though he has not known me. But that's not God's fault. <clears throat> the Pharisees, the scribes, it was proclaimed that by the Lord Jesus Christ himself that theirs was the righteousness that was so great that it had to be exceeded by those who were born into the kingdom of God. That's how you know that you're in the kingdom. Your righteousness exceeds their righteousness. Their righteousness was an efforts, a works righteousness, a legal righteousness. Our righteousness is the imputed righteousness of God himself. Therefore, our righteousness being God's righteousness, imputed or deposited in our account, exceeds theirs. They, having that righteousness that Jesus said that our righteousness must exceed, is of such note that they knew the Lord's will and did it not, therefore they shall be beaten with many stripes. So it doesn't matter whether it's Shebna, Pharaoh, scribes and Pharisees, whoever it is that's been raised up, they are responsible for knowing God for themselves and for communicating God to others. Amen. So that verse 25 of Isaiah 22 is speaking of Shebna. In that day when I make Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, uh, to be uh, anointed in his stead, he said, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fashioned in the sure place be removed? He's going to be removed. 
He had opportunity to bring glory to God. He had opportunity to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. And who is that? The servant of all. You have two mindsets. One of them comes from a mighty angel. Probably one of, if not the most, but one of the most glorious angels there has ever been. Son of God, who came on the scene, not in the vastness of uh, pomp and circumstance, but as a babe in a manger lay, laying in a, 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 not only a cow barn, but the trough that the cows ate out of. That's where he was. That was his bed. Lucifer said, I will, became the devil. Jesus Christ said, thy will be done. And God has highly exalted him above every name in the world. So you have Shebna with the mindset of Lucifer. I'm going to use this for my own glory. The worst politicians we've ever had in this nation and have now, the worst among them, are those who are feeding off of this nation for their own selfish uh, greed and for covetousness. That's what Jesus warned about the Pharisees and the scribes. Beware of their covetousness. But those who will serve the people, they are more in the framework of Jesus Christ than anybody else. Pastors, teachers, parents, uh, not just teachers of the church, but school teachers, uh, office, officers of the law, people who want to serve the people or in the framework of Eliakim. They're raised up by God. Shebna, his name just means tomb God said you ain't going to be buried there I'm going to cover you in, in captivity so these are the two men that are contrast here that are contrasted throughout the entire scriptures those who will serve God and those who will serve themselves at God's expense but it doesn't matter they being raised up by God in his providence are responsible to God for doing what's right and glorifying God. There's a lot of times when you have supervisors, presidents of some society you belong to or somebody in authority or whatever that you can't go against their authority, the powers, the authorities that be are, are ordained of God, Romans 13. Don't be a, re, a, a, a rebellious against authority, but understand this, that all authority is not righteous. Amen. You can't raise your hand against the sheriff or mayor or the policeman, or whoever, whoever's in charge. To do that is to raise your hand against God himself. So they are a minister of God to do his work. Because the one thing the devil would have in society is total chaos. God's word says, let all things be done how? decently and in order and the devil would have chaos and would destroy all
framework of order that God has established. So this is what is happening. That's what you see in verse 25 of Isaiah 22. Shebna was a nail that had been fastened in a sure place, but you know that it is not that kind of sure uh, nail fastened in a sure place as, as we find uh, uh, there in verse 23. Because, in verse 25, he shall be removed. Sooner or later, those people that lift themselves up above the authority of God and be, begin to use their place and their status and their authority and their power for their own self glory and for their own Till Jesus Christ came in his incarnation. How many years of human history had there been, as far as we know? 4,000. So the world lay first in darkness, and the God of this world was ruling over the spirits and the minds of men. And God didn't take him out. Until it was time for our hill, let me get it right, El, uh, Eliakim. I'm going to make his daddy to be the nail if I don't watch out. Y'all forgive me if I do. If I say Hilkanah, I'm trying to talk about Eliakim, the son of Hilkanah. But it said, they that sat in darkness. Because Jesus Christ is the light of the world and the light of life. So that's how he started creation, physical, Genesis chapter 1. The world, earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and God said, let there be light and there was light. That's why he started that. That's why he started the New Testament. 400 years of darkness. First word he says is to the priest that comes into the temple to offer his, to, to fill out his, his time of being a priesthood, uh, of being in the priesthood. God will take him out. And God knows exactly who he is and what he's doing and how he is misrepresenting God. That's what you have in this chapter. So we see that he is here to replace uh, another person. Can you find Ezekiel chapter 15? Now, in the second verse of Ezekiel 15, what kind of tree do we see? Vine tree. Now, even if you have to turn over there, put your finger right here, and the answer to this question is in John 15, 5. Who is the vine tree and who are the branches? Christ is the vine, we're the branches. Okay, you got it? And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, what is the vine tree more than any tree? 
or than, than a branch which is among the trees of the forest? Shall the wood that is of the vine be taken thereof to do any work? Are you going to cut off part of that vine and try to nail it into a hole and say, that's a pig, that's a nail in a sure place? No, you're not going to do it. Or will men take a pin of it to hang any vessel thereon? Wait a minute, Brother Gene. It's going against everything you've been preaching. I hope that's what you're thinking. I hope you are confused and aggravated and saying that old coot, he just... He just circumventing everything he did. Stick with me. Hang on. Listen, you don't take part of a vine and use it as a peg to hang things on. What do you do with it? Verse 4, Behold, it is cast into the fire for the fuel. The fire devoureth both the ends of it and the midst of it is burned. It burns good. Is it fit or meat for any work? The answer is no, but it makes good kindling. Behold, when it was whole, it was meat for no work. How much less shall it be fit for any uh, work when the fire hath devoured it and it is burned? Hang on, here we come. Therefore thus... Now, the vine over there in John 15, 5 is fruitful and bears fruit to the glory of God. That's what it's supposed to be. You don't go to the vine to find something to make a peg out of, to hang stuff on. You go to the vine for grapes. But he's saying, these people that are inhabitants of Jerusalem now, I'm going to send them into captivity and cast them, as it were, into the fires of damnation and destruction because they sure do burn good. May I ask you something? Go ahead, you're going to anyhow. Yep, thank you. There are the tares and there is the wheat. The wheat he gathers into his barn, but the tares he... Cast into the fire. That's what we're talking about here. It's the same plant. The same sun and the same rain falls on both the tares and the wheat. But the vine, if you try to use it and get something out of it that's fit for work, you can't. It ain't no good. But the vine whose root is Christ and who are connected to the vine, they bring forth fruit to the glory of Almighty God. So he's using this to show us the difference between the harlot church and the true church. Inhabitants of Jerusalem have committed a trespass against the Lord God. So you have here in Ezekiel 15, uh, it ain't really a play on words. It's just showing you that when the vine is uh, usable by God, according to that word,
no good. I put him there like the darkness that was on the face of the deep so that you could appreciate the light. I put him there so that you would understand. So that's what he's doing, and he's showing you the difference. And again, because verse 25 of Ezekiel, no, Isaiah 22, stayed dark to me for so many years, I'm emphasizing this heavily. Forgive me if I assume that you are as slow to learn as I was. But I'm giving you the benefit of everything God has taught me for those last 30 years and finally coming to see this this past Friday in my study in the town of Tyrone where I made a mess out of that devotion at the school. Tyrone, it was called elementary then. I don't care whether you like it or not. That's what it was, elementary school. Okay, so the Lord said, In that day saith the Lord of hosts, Shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed and be cut down and fall? And listen, and the burden that was upon it shall be cut off, for the Lord has spoken it. Many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, in that day, Lord, Lord, we have prophesied in thy name and done many wonderful works. And I shall profess to them, depart from me, ye that work and But the Lord raises up another one. Second Kings chapter twenty three. And I think it's verse twenty four. Yeah, that's a good one. Second Kings 2, 3, 2, 4. 23, 24. Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits and the wizards and the images and the idols and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem did Josiah put away that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah, the priest, found in the house of the Lord. So here was one that was very jealous for the things of the Lord and put them away. Now, you can't imagine that all these idols, all these images, all these things that resulted from familiar spirits and all were not amazing in their detail. Were not
And I hear people talking about going and see the great works of art in Europe and seeing all these things that involve false worship. And I look at it and I think, well, wait a minute. What's wrong with me? Boy, that's really appealing. That is amazing. That is awe-inspiring. Mm -hmm. And you have to know that it couldn't have been raised up without artisans that had the gift to be able to do that. But it makes me wonder if it's not the Lord testing us to see whether we love the Lord our God or not. And you better be careful, else you find a Shebna that has personality, that has authority, that launches forth into his uh, authority and his power and his office to do, and you get sucked in and caught up with it and wind up outcast into captivity along with him and wind up in the fire with him. I want you to listen to what his uh, Shebna's clothing did to Eliakim. In Isaiah 22, let's read again verse 20. It won't hurt us. And it shall come to pass in that day go and if I could go I wouldn't go I don't want to travel I've had enough of travel but we see these guys that are the mayors of towns and they got on these big old red thick heavy robes and this huge monstrous chain around their neck and boy he's the mayor of the town they're all down at the train station and the band's playing do to do to do to do and there's a platform there and only the mayor gets to stand up on the highest part of the podium and he's in all those robes. And that seems to really mean something to those people. But God said, I'm going to take those robes that seem to mean something to Shebna and the rest of you and I'm going to clothe Eliakim with them. I will clothe him with thy robe. Now listen. I will strengthen him with thy girdle. Now, I had never wore a girdle before. But I'm sure that that foundation garment would tend to strengthen your back. But I ain't sure that that's what it's talking about completely here. But it is, you're going to have on the royal robes, the big old gold chain, and somewhat of a cummerbund. to him it's going to help him and I will commit thy government into his hand and he not you shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judea so God is going to take from one man all of those in authoritative garments and put them on the other man now the thing about that is when God put those garments on Shebna, he went lopsided and got...
Hebrews chapter 7. How does that, how does that affix itself to our nail in a sure place, the Lord Jesus Christ? Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 11. If therefore perfection, perfect fellowship with God, were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest another tribe he didn't come from the tribe of Levi of which of this tribe that he came from nobody ever gave attendance at the altar there was not a single person from the tribe of Judah that ever gave attendance at the altar of God in the old economy verse 14 for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Okay, that's evident, but what is far more evident in verse 15? Up another priest. There ariseth another priest who is made not of the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. There are right now, in eternal glory, standing in the presence of Jesus of Nazareth, priests of Israel. Some of those priests came to know who God was, and some of those priests received Christ as their Savior. And they're standing there in the presence of the great high priest, and they are authorized by the turning over of their garments under the law to receiving the garment of righteousness under the law of grace and redemption and Eliakim, the one God raised up, is going to receive all the vestures of the priesthood. Hebrews 8.1. I hope that's it. Yeah. Hebrews 8.1. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. This is the total. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And these priests who faithfully even... Not bleed like I cut my finger and I'm bleeding, but bleat, B-L-E-E-T, bleating lamb's eyes. And know that that innocent lamb was going to suffer death and total giving of his blood for that guilty sinner. And they're standing there praising God that Jesus Christ made their robes to be his robe and that he is that great high priest that's clothed in the glory of almighty God and you know what it strengthens him the government comes to him 
And then it says, And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open it. And we only have to go back to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 and see that this was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born. That was the child born in the manger. Unto us a son is given. That's the eternal son of God that God gave. Shebna's government now becomes Eliakim's. All government, all authority, whether it was like Cyrus or Pharaoh or whoever it was that had authority but misused it, all of that, take the talent from him and give it to the one that had the ten talents. And every authority there's ever been that did it righteously and godly, it shall be ascribed to the glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, for the government shall be upon his shoulders. And he says, Chapter 3 and verse number 7. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. That's Jesus Christ. So all of this is being turned over to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 1 17, and I fell dead at his feet, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. What is this sure place? And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. Look at Isaiah 33. We may have already seen this. Nope. Isaiah 33. And verse 2. O Lord, be gracious unto us. We have waited for thee. Be thou their arm every morning. Our salvation also in the time of trouble. Didn't we just sing a shelter in the time of storm? This is that sure place. It may have been a time of trouble. It may have been a time of anxiety. It was the time of the cross. 
If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. The suffering has to come first. Isaiah 54 and verse 2. Isaiah 54 and verse 2. We find, dear soul, that this sure place is that that the Lord has established for us, that it has not worked for others, and it will only work for us as God. Lord Jesus Christ, that he brings forth more from less because he is entrusted as the nail fastened there and we trusted the Lord when it wasn't convenient to. The sure place is the place of inconvenience to the flesh, inconvenience to the soul, Inconvenient as far as the sufferings of the cross being fitted upon us. But in that time we trusted the Lord and he turned that place into a sure place for us. Hebrews. Again, Hebrews. Chapter 1. Then verse number 12. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up. That is the works of thy hands. Verse 10. They'll wax old as a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up. And they shall be changed. But thou art the same. And thy years shall not fail. What shall you be thinking when you see the elements melted with fervent heat? What shall you be trusting in when you see the world on fire and all the works therein? What shall you do when God shall destroy the heavens and the earth with fire to purge it out for the last time? You trust in the same one you're trusting in now. Jesus Christ the same. Well, you know, Peter got to walk with Jesus and he saw him like this. John got to walk with Jesus and he laid his head on his breast. He got to know him like this. The woman at the well, the woman with the issue of blood, uh, the blind man, all of these, they saw him. And, no, he's the same. He's the same to you today. Jesus Christ the same. The sure place is faith in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we can finish the verse. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday. That is, in the New Testament age when he was on the earth, or even in the Old Testament as he appeared in his manifestations of himself. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the godly, Godhead bodily. Today, present faith, he's the same. And guess what? Forever. How are you going to rest when the heavens are on fire? It was an awful mess on September the 11th, 2001, wasn't it? Any penny and ducky lucky, the sky is falling. And it was. And it was a horrible mess. 
But that's not a drop in the bucket as compared to what's going to happen when China and Russia and Asia, England and Spain and France and America and the The atoms, they're going to be on fire. What will you do? Hang on to the nail in a sure place because he's the same right now with all this burning up as he was when he saved me and when I walked with God. Ain't God good? Amen.